Gnostic Radio is made possible through the financial support of listeners like you. To make a tax-deductible donation, visit our website at GnosticTeachings.org. For questions about this or other lectures, we invite you to participate in the free discussion forum at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you for your support. May all beings be happy. Today's lecture is entitled Seeking the Master. We will discuss some practical aspects of spirituality and religion that affect all of us at whatever level and whatever our interests in approaching these kinds of studies. We're going to be looking at an aspect of yoga, which is known in the East as Guru Yoga, The word yoga does not refer to stretching exercises or postures or work with the physical body. The word yoga really means to unite, to yoke, to harness. And it comes from, of course, Sanskrit in the traditions of India. Yoga, in its root form, is the same as our Western word, religion, which comes from the Latin religare, which also means to unite, or to bind, to yoke, to harness. But the implication in both terms is a reunion to unite again, or to reestablish, to reform something that has been lost or broken. When we hear the term yoga these days, of course, most people are referring to hatha yoga, which is a very um, introductory form of yoga, whose original Creation was inspired by the need to help meditators cultivate some physical strength so they could meditate longer without the physical body creating obstacles in their practice of meditation. But nowadays, hatha yoga has been turned into a business. This is not the kind of yoga we're referring to. We're referring to real yoga, which is spiritual. And spiritual work, spiritual benefits are acquired by working with the consciousness, not just with the body, not just with beliefs. The term yoga as well has become popularized in the West. I'm sorry, the term guru has become popularized in the West. And the Western conception, the Western image that's conjured when this word guru is spoken is usually of the leader of a cult. Is usually a very fat person. Someone who's uh, maybe a tyrant or a dictator, or someone who's very sanctimonious, maybe dresses in white or has long hair and a beard. Or perhaps that other cliche of a yogi sitting on top of a mountain, alone. These images have been propagated by people who don't understand what a guru is. And in general, it's also 
because of people who are just trying to make business. The term guru just means teacher. That's all it means. In India, when you're a child, you go to kindergarten to study with your guru. You go to first grade to study with your guru. That's your teacher. And any teacher that you have in India is called a guru. But of course, if you use the term guru in in general, people from India or related cultures understand that generally speaking, when we use the term guru, we do indicate a spiritual teacher. But the term has those other uses. So let's not confuse them. So guru yoga, if we combine the etymology of these two words and the meanings of these two words, we see would be the practical mysticism to unite with a teacher, but with the consciousness. Not as a belief, not as a kind of dependence or codependency, but a melding of minds, a union Spiritually speaking, a union of consciousness. So this begs the question, is a guru necessary? Is a teacher necessary? Of course, if we look at practical life, we know that everything that we need to know, we have to learn from someone. When we're a child... We have many teachers. Some are called that and some are not. And whether these practical things that we have to learn, such as how to speak, how to walk, how to eat, how to dress ourselves, we learn by relating to others, by observing others, or by being instructed. So all of the people in our childhood who helped us with those skills we're our gurus. We're our teachers. And these are people to whom we should have gratitude. We should be grateful. Because they've taught us things that we need and we use all the time. For a child, it would be difficult or perhaps impossible to learn the things that are necessary to learn in life without teachers. One can hardly imagine a child growing up isolated and alone and what that child would become. Probably little more than an animal without any skills to relate to others or take care of themselves. The same is true of any spiritual endeavor. We need teachers. We need teachers in order to help us understand, to help us grow, to help us teach ourselves. But there are different kinds of teachers. There are many levels of teachers. For example, as we are now, whatever age we are now, we need a certain type of instructor, a certain kind of teacher. We don't need the teacher that we had when we were in first grade. So we've learned those things. We need another type of teacher, someone who can teach us something different. The same is true spiritually. There are many types of teachers that we will encounter as we work to understand this mind that we have within. In the traditions of guru yoga of the East, we find a, a great emphasis on the necessity to find a reliable teacher. And in fact, Tsongkhapa, who was the spiritual master who lived in Tibet, who founded the tradition of the Dalai Lamas, stated that the very basis of spiritual success is the teacher. The very foundation of any attainment or liberation is one's teacher. And the point of view expressed in this statement is that it's from the teacher that we receive instruction. We receive guidance. We receive assistance, kindness. And it's interesting to look at 
these Eastern traditions and the term that they, at least in Tibetan Buddhism, that they apply to their teachers, this word lama. Most of us have probably heard this word. And the word lama has very deep roots, very uh, complex meanings. But on a very simple level, we can just look at these two components, these two consonants that make the word. This component la relates to the universal binding cosmic energy that lies at the base of all existence. This is a sort of cosmic force like chi. And la is a reminder to the Tibetan mind of this universal energy, universal force. And that's why this term la is used as an honorific. So if you were to greet a Tibetan person who you respect or who's a little older than you, you would put la at the end of their name. You would say lob seng la, pema la, tenzin la. It's the same as in Japanese, if you add the name um, San at the end of a name, Hoji-san. San is an honorific. It's a term of respect. Like in Sanskrit, you have the same. In, in Hinduism, Ji. Sridhar Ji. Amrita Ji. And these are honorific terms that show respect. So Lama, La begins with Lama begins with that la, an honorific. And ma, of course, is a universal term for the mother. Ma. In the Eastern traditions, in Hinduism, in Sanskrit, in Buddhism, in Tibetan language, in Hindi, ma means mother, just like in the West. Children grow up and say, ma, amma, amma to call their mother. The same as in the Western world. So Lama is this universal binding force of the cosmic divine mother. And the Lama is the embodiment of that. The Lama is the one who is there to assist the students with love, with compassion, as a reflection or as a vehicle of that love of the Divine Mother, the Cosmic Mother. So in tradition of Guru Yoga in the East, the practitioners, the disciples, treat the Lama as a Buddha, as an as a embodiment of the Divine, with a great deal of respect and veneration. So the basis of that is the desire or the intention to merge with that ma, with that la, with the cosmic divine forces, which are being channeled or directed through that lama in the form of the teachings, in the form of the dharma. And this is the basis of guru yoga. So the Eastern traditions emphasize the importance of finding a teacher. However, this tradition has been imported to the West and has now been mingled with the idiosyncrasy, idiosyncrasy of our own Western mentality. And there have been some unexpected results. In the West, we have a very different perspective of a teacher. In the Western traditions we have this point of view which is rooted in both Greek and Hebraic psychologies. Whether we're aware of it or not. Because all of us who've been raised in the West have been raised in an environment and our personalities have been formed in an environment within which the teacher is seen as a spiritual authority as someone who can tell us what is right and wrong. But in the East, this is not so. There's a striking difference 
between Eastern and Western psychologies on this point. And you can see it if you look at the, the role of a priest in a Western tradition. A priest in a Western tradition is often a confessor, someone who the disciples go to in order to confess their sins, to confess their mistakes, and to ask what they should do. This is generally not the case in Eastern traditions. The Lama, the teacher, the guru, is seen as a guide. And there are cases in which a student may approach a teacher for guidance or assistance with physical things, with life issues. But there's a strong distinction between the two. The Western psychology is afraid of that authority figure and fears punishment, fears going to hell, fears being excommunicated or exiled. And this is because of the Western development of spiritual authority through churches and through religions in the West. So we have to recognize in our own psyche these unconscious tendencies of how we perceive our teachers. Do we approach our teachers with this subtle fear, a subtle influence that pushes us to show ourselves as good students because we're afraid of hell or we're afraid of being kicked out or exiled or rejected? This is a harmful attitude. This is a very harmful point of view which is generally unconscious in students. It's harmful for both the student and the instructor and the teacher. The student who has this approach, who feels afraid, who, who wants to prove themselves or be seen as a good student in order to feel secure, damages their own potential and also puts the instructor in an unfortunate position. So this is an attitude that is very important for us as Western students to analyze. So when we approach the study of religion, the study of spirituality, these kinds of unconscious attitudes can corrupt our own reception of the teaching. Rather than receiving the Dharma, the the knowledge, in a pure way, consciously, we can be receiving it filtered through that fear that if we don't do it right, we'll be kicked out. If we don't do it right, we will go to hell. And this is a wrong attitude. The instructor as well has the obligation to teach without manipulating the student, without relying on fear to inspire a student. Instructors who use fear to inspire students are creating a problem in that student. So as a student of religion or a student of spirituality, we need teachers. And we need a teacher precisely because we're trying to go somewhere we haven't been before. We're trying to reach a state that we have not experienced. And the only one who can guide you to that is someone who's been there, someone who's experienced that. But the challenge is, If we ourselves as students have not experienced it, how can we evaluate someone else on that basis? If we've not experienced it, how can we know if someone else has? How can we have that security or that sense of knowing that the person we're approaching as a teacher is genuine? The answer to that is by studying the doctrine. We have to study the teachings. We have to study all of the great masters because in their base, all the religions of the world are coming from the same root. And in their fundamentals, they agree. So by studying the teachings deeply, by meditating, by putting them into practice, we gather our own experiential knowledge, not just beliefs, but we begin to experience and understand the basis of those teachings. And from that, we can much uh, more accurately understand and reflect upon the words of a teacher to see if they really know what they're talking about. 
This is important because there are a lot of charlatans. There are a lot of teachers who really don't know what they're talking about. A lot of people who present themselves as great leaders or guides who really are fake. And it's mentioned in the Bible repeatedly that there are many false Christs appearing, false prophets. It's responsibility of the student to learn how to discriminate. So today we're going to talk about some guidelines that we can all use in order to determine who we can trust. This is important because when you're seeking a teacher, when you're looking to relate with a teacher, this is not a superficial thing. A teacher that you develop a relationship with, you're going to place into their their hands your own spiritual well-being. Maybe even your sanity. It's important that you are very cautious. You take your time. Listen to your heart. Study the teaching. Don't go fast. Oftentimes, a student will arrive at a school finding a teacher and immediately sign themselves up for everything. Become very enthusiastic. Enthusiasm is good. And energy to work is good, but we also need to be prudent. In the Eastern traditions, they rely on something called lineage. And the lineage is a, a propagation of the teaching that's passed from teacher to disciple. It's a form of authority, which is passed on. And generally, these traditions have certain kinds of rules. And, of course, are accompanied by an array of titles. Titles, inherited um, responsibilities. Western students often become fascinated with this Eastern tradition of lineage and seek that in Western traditions, but it does not exist. The lineage format does not exist in Western religions traditionally and it does not exist in Gnosis. And there's a strong cause behind that. In the Gnostic tradition, we recognize that these times are very confusing. The ego is very strong. The mind is bewildered and easily confused. Students want easy answers and will look for physical evidence upon which they can evaluate a teacher. This happens in the East as well. Disciples in Eastern traditions will often evaluate a teacher based on how many followers they have. And the more followers they have, the greater the teacher must be. This, of course, is false. They also may evaluate a teacher based on his titles. If he has a very long, impressive-sounding title, he must be a great teacher. Of course, this is also false. Or they may evaluate him based on the donations he gets, the type of uh, monastery that he runs, or how much land he's been given, or how many brocade robes he wears, or the kind of hat that he wears how impressive he appears to be. All this is false. None of these things are indicators of conscious development. This is why in the Eastern traditions, they have attempted to establish this lineage in order to try to give uh, new students a way of gauging instructors. But unfortunately, the ego is so heavy in mankind that the lineage tradition has suffered huge problems. And nowadays, even the great masters of the Eastern traditions recognize that lineage is not a sign of true spiritual development because many of the titles that lamas or or teachers inherit are merely inherited. They're not acquired because of true spiritual development. 
They inherit them. So this is not a sign of spiritual development or spiritual reliability. So in the Gnostic movement, we do not rely upon lineage. In fact, there are some who claim to. There are Gnostic instructors who claim to have inherited the lineage. But this does not exist. The only lineage that we recognize in Gnosis is spiritual, is internal. is something you cannot see physically. And regarding this, the, the Master Samael on Vior stated something very clear that is important for us as students to reflect upon. And I'm going to read this quote. He said, The Gnostic movement is impersonal. It is made up by humble laborers. Therefore, let us reject any personalization. Let us not accept imposing individuals. No one is better than anyone else. Among us, we are all laborers, bricklayers, mechanics, farmers, writers, physicians, etc. We do not worship noble titles, nor resounding titles like doctor, lawyer, guru, master, elder, brother, avatar, etc. Because among Gnostics, we are all friends. And Aquarius is the house of friends. We humans are more or less imperfect. Thus I, the one who writes this book, am not anyone's master. And I beg people not to follow me. I am imperfect. I am an imperfect human just like anyone else. And it is an error to follow someone who is imperfect. Let everyone follow their I am. The I am is that mysterious energy mentioned by Jesus throughout his teachings when he says, I am the way. And this is the cosmic Christ. This is universal energy. This is not a personal being. It is not an individual. It's a force. The force of the I am is called Avalokiteshvara or Chinrezi in Eastern traditions. It's called Krishna. It's called Vishnu. Called Quetzalcoatl, Buddha, Jesus, Christ. This is an impersonal energy, an impersonal force who does not claim t- titles, who does not claim authority, but who is simply the pure force of love, just love. No control, no demanding manipulations, just love. So the Gnostic movement we do not use titles. We do not use or rely upon so-called recognitions. In the East, there is a, a long tradition of recognizing masters or recognizing incarnations in order to give them spiritual authority. In Gnosis, we do not use such a system. There has been no reliance upon a lineage in Gnosis precisely because the ego is so strong in all of us. And it's been noticed that when someone is given some kind of a spiritual authority, that the ego will take advantage of that and harm the teacher and harm the student. Therefore, Gnosis in the Gnostic tradition, we don't place any person over any other person. As the Master said, we're all friends. So we could probably be better off if we used the term spiritual friend rather than teacher or spiritual friend rather than master. And the reason is all of us have within the I am. All of us have within our own inner divinity. We are, in fact, equal. We may be at different stages of life, or different stages of development. No one is better than anyone else. And in the Western mentality, this is another factor that's very different from Eastern mentality. People from the East become very confused when they perceive the Western tendency of feeling bad about ourselves. Because this doesn't really exist in the East. Americans and Europeans and Canadians 
have this uh, psychological quality of feeling guilty or feeling inferior or feeling shame, having low self-esteem. These tendencies are very rare in the East, but they're very prevalent in the West. And this low self-esteem or poor understanding of one's true nature is a very harmful factor that can poison a teacher-student relationship. How do we find a teacher? Before we even look, we need to look to our own selves to see that we have the right point of view. What is it we expect when we look for a teacher? What is it we're expecting when we're trying to comprehend this kind of teaching? In the Eastern tradition, I'll refer to, uh, today a lot to Tsongkhapa because he spoke very directly and clearly about the teacher-student relationship. One of the things that he emphasized is that the student needs to examine their own mind when searching for a teacher. And the student really needs to have three qualities in order to protect themselves. And the first one is to have an open mind, to have an objective mind, to be able to look at things without bias. For example, many students, many people in the Western world have been raised in an environment with Christian beliefs or Christian influences. And many, many people have been traumatized by those influences and have been, um, have spiritual trauma because of contradictions in those teachings or contradictions in those teachers. So it can happen that a Western person, simply out of um, a desire to contradict the Christian belief, will become a person practicing witchcraft or enter into satanic cults and studying occultism. This is not done with an open mind or with a sincere interest. It's done simply as an unconscious impulse to reject Christianity. And this is harmful. This is an unconscious drive, an unconscious influence. And the same can happen if someone coming into Gnosis. There are people who may come into the Gnostic study, the Gnostic tradition, simply because they have a spiritual trauma that they're trying to contradict. So the sooner that we as students can recognize that quality in ourselves, some kind of subtle bias or subtle uh, impulse to contradict an experience we've had, the sooner we'll be able to get past that and acquire some real understanding. The second quality is the intelligence to tell right from wrong. And this is a kind of discrimination. We need to rely on our own judgment to be able to tell when something is appropriate and when it's not. And this is particularly important when we're approaching a teacher. If we are approaching and investigating a teacher of some kind, but we see a behavior that strikes us as wrong, we need to pay attention to that. If we see that teacher, for example, flirting with students, this is a wrong behavior. Or making lewd comments or inappropriate jokes. These are behaviors that we need to take seriously. It doesn't mean that we have to totally reject and walk away from that person. But we need to take it in context and use our own judgment. Is this a good environment for me to be in or not? We need to make that decision for ourselves. Don't go blindly into any school or with any teacher. Rely on your sense of right and wrong. Faith is obviously a very important factor. 
But faith must be tempered by our own sense of what's right. Blind faith takes you in blindness. And a blind person will suffer and fall. And the third quality, of course, is just to have the enthusiasm to study that subject. Sometimes people come to these kinds of studies without any enthusiasm at all. It's strange, but it happens. So it's good for us to really be sincere with ourselves. Are we really enthusiastic about studying this material, or are we doing it for some unconscious reason, some kind of a bias, perhaps, or desire? Some people come to studies, such as Gnosis or some kind of religion, out of a desire for power or desire for money. And this is not real enthusiasm in the subject. It's an egotistical desire. In all these cases, we simply need to be sincere and evaluate ourselves. We have to look at what's driving us, what impulses are manipulating us in subtle ways. We have to see how we react to the teacher. We have to see what kind of person this teacher is based on our own sense of what's right and wrong. But most of all, we need to look at what we expect. This is a very important question. We have to understand from the point of view of the teachings what a teacher can actually do for us. Because there are different levels of teachers. As Samael Samael Umbiore indicated, we should not follow anyone. But what does that mean? How is it that we need a teacher but we shouldn't follow anyone? How do we understand that? A teacher looked at from the point of view of a spiritual friend is someone who simply can give us advice. Someone who can help us understand something. But such a person should never be put in the position of being a dictator, of having the power or authority to tell people how to live their lives. That's up to each individual. In Gnosis, we do not recognize authority in this form. Just like Krishnamurti said, authority destroys. Authority, in terms of physical authority in a school, is a very dangerous element. When the sense of authority becomes imbalanced, it's destructive for the student and the teacher. Who is it that gives authority? You. Each of us succumbs or allows another person to have authority over us. And in some level, this is inherent in the nature of a teacher and student. When you submit yourself to receiving someone's instruction, you are submitting, in a sense, to a form of authority because you're accepting that person in that moment as having some kind of experience or wisdom that you want to understand. But how far does that authority extend? In other words, how far do you allow that authority to be extended? And this is where the complications arise. In the Eastern concept of Guru Yoga, there is this strong emphasis on the student fully submitting themselves in every way to the guru. We all know the stories. We all know the horror stories that have come out of people making wrong decisions and trusting false teachers and in turn have been abused in every way you can imagine. This is part of the reason why in Gnosis we reject this form of guru yoga. The real guru is in you. The purpose for the tradition of guru yoga is to teach you to see the guru in your own mind. 
So in the Gnostic tradition, we do away with the formalities, all the little steps of that process that's taught in the East. We go directly to the point. The real guru is your own mind. Your own mind, when it's undefiled, when it is in its pure state, is the Buddha, is the guru, is the master. This is inside of you. So your physical teacher simply has the the job to help you see that. And that's all. The physical teacher does not have the right to tell you how you should live your life. A physical teacher can make a suggestion if you ask, but has no right to make demands of you or manipulate you or reject you from the teaching if you don't do something the way the teacher demands you do it. These are all forms of manipulation and pride. And the reason, another reason that this is so important is that there are a lot of charlatans. There are a lot of people who call themselves master, who go around boasting, even in very subtle ways, that they are such and such master. They may not say it in a public class. They may only say it in a so-called advanced class. But the proclamation, the self-proclamation of mastery is a lie. Why is that? Because the master, the guru, is not us. It is the being. It is the I am. It is that primordial base of consciousness that we all share inside. The Master Samael stated about this in a very clear way. The value of the human person, which is the intellectual animal called a human being, is less than the ash of a cigarette. However, the fools feel themselves to be giants. Unfortunately, with all the pseudo-esoteric currents, a great amount of mythomaniac people exist. Individuals who feel themselves to be masters, people who enjoy when others call them masters, individuals who believe themselves to be gods, individuals who presume to be saints. The only one who is truly great is the spirit, the innermost. We, the intellectual animals, are leaves that the wind tosses about. No student of occultism is a master. True masters are only those who have reached the fifth initiation of major mysteries. And before the fifth initiation, nobody is a master. But even then, when the fifth initiation of major mysteries has been accomplished spiritually, internally, the master is the being, not the physical person. The master is inside, is not physical. This brings to mind a story that the Master Samael told. Talking about uh, monks in the monastery in uh, Tibet who would have to wait and endure many hours dealing with their egotistical instructor until the moment when the instructor began to teach and in that moment his inner being his inner I am would come out through the words and give wisdom. And it's in those moments that the value of that teacher could be seen. But when that I am, that inner master was not present, the teacher was terrible, was impossible to deal with. And it took great endurance and patience for the students to deal with him because he was such a terrible person. This, This story indicates something really important. Instructors have ego. Instructors are people just like you. Be careful and observe yourself. Are you projecting onto the instructor? This is called transference. When you're projecting your own image, your idealized image, onto your instructor. For example, many of us, when we study Gnosis, we see the beauty of this teaching and the power of it. And subtle form in the mind can arise unconsciously where we then subtle, in a subtle way think that the teacher must have already accomplished all of this. The teacher must already be awake 
The teacher must already be a master or a great bodhisattva. And when you develop this point of view, this attitude, it's harmful not only to you, but to that person. Because then there are unspoken expectations, unconscious expectations. And in psychology, Western psychology, this is called transference. Then counter-transference can arise, where the unconscious attitudes of the instructor will react to that. The other aspect of that is that you as a student might have unconscious projections of the teacher being like one of your parents. So you may be seeking their approval, seeking security, seeking love in similar unconscious ways to the way you do with your own physical parents. And this is also harmful. So you can see there's a lot to learn from your relationship with the teacher. And this is why it's an important relationship. But it requires that you as a student take responsibility for your own mind. And this is, again, a very key thing. The teacher cannot save you. The teacher cannot liberate you. The teacher can only help. A teacher can put the tools into your hand and show you how they work. But you have to build your own house, your own temple. This is why in, in Buddhism, it's, it's often repeated that you have to be your own master. Which some students get confused by. Why do they say that we have to have guru yoga and follow the guru when they say we have to be our own master? Because it's true. You learn from your teacher, but you have to do the work. So let's look at some of the qualifications that a teacher should have. So we can understand a little better how to relate to a teacher and how we ourselves can grow. The Maitreya Buddha gave this teaching. And the Buddha Maitreya is a very compassionate teacher. And recognizing that students and, and teachers have troubles in their relationships, the Maitreya Buddha, long, long time ago, gave this teaching to the Tibetans. And so I'm just going to outline this. This is, uh, if you want to study it more, it's in the Maitreya's Sutra, which he gave, which is called the Ornament of the Mahayana Sutras. And he outlined ten essential qualities that a teacher should have. The first one is a disciplined mind. And this first step is to have discipline in ethics. Now, of course, in Gnosis, this question of ethics is a subtle one because we recognize that morality is just like personality. It's a child of its time. We're not talking about morality. What's moral for us is immoral in China. And what's moral for the Chinese is immoral for Americans or for Canadians. So we're not talking about morality, which is cultural and rooted in time. We're talking about ethics. And ethics are related to karma. To know what is ethical, you have to know what is right to do and what is wrong to do. But this is moment to moment. Because in some moments, something that's right would be wrong the next day. And you can only know this if you really know how to pay attention, to be conscious, and to listen to intuition. In Sanskrit, these are called yama and niyama, which mean to do and to not do. So this is the first quality an instructor should have, to know how to act in the right way at the right time. The second quality is to have a calmed mind. In other words, this is uh, to have higher training in concentration and meditation. So this would, this would be dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. In other words, an instructor should be able to access the true nature of the mind which is undefiled. Now, immediately in this list, what we see is that the instructor needs to have practical experience.
You cannot teach something that you do not know. If your own mind is undisciplined, you cannot teach someone how to discipline their mind. So an instructor, a teacher, must have the capacity to discipline their own mind. Otherwise, they cannot teach. And of course, this is in levels. Some are more accomplished than others. Each of us, in our own way, is a teacher already, whether we realize it or not. And we can all teach at our level. But from the point of view of the student, when you're looking for these qualities in your instructor, they should have these qualities a little more than you. Not perfect, but a little more. So at least they have a little more experience from which you can benefit, from which you can draw inspiration or understanding. The third quality is to have a thoroughly calmed mind. And what does that mean? This is to have a mind that is so well disciplined that this person comprehends that there is no self. This is to understand right view or the absolute, to have experience that, that the I is false. In other words, this instructor should have experience or understanding of the doctrine of no self. That doesn't mean that, that all of their activities will be egoless, because we all have ego. But when discussing the nature of emptiness or discussing the nature of the absolute, they should at least have an appreciation for that, a respect for that, and the intention to comprehend it practically. The fourth is to have knowledge exceeding the student. But this is not intellectual knowledge. This is not book study. It can include that. But we're not talking about the doctrine of the I, which is intellectualism. We're talking about knowledge of the heart, the heart doctrine. And this is intuitive experiential knowledge. You may at some point enter into a school or a a Gnostic environment and see a teacher-student relationship where the student is able to quote the books, to quote the scriptures, to go on at length reciting aspects of the doctrine. The teacher cannot do that. You might observe that. That doesn't mean the teacher is less than the student. Being able to recite doctrine, being able to quote scripture, is useful. These are good things for us to acquire. But real knowledge is experiential. And experiential knowledge to experience the nature of no-self is very different from studying it and understanding it intellectually. To understand how to explain the nature of a sephira or a sephiroth, to explain, let's say, what tifereth means. To understand that intellectually is good and useful, but to experience that is the heart doctrine. So this quality of knowledge is experiential knowledge. In other words, this is real gnosis. Because real gnosis is experiential. It's not book study. So don't be misled by people who appear to have a lot of knowledge in the intellect or can quote things and recite things and give bewilderingly confusing or bewilderingly vast explanations of things. This is not heart doctrine. And some students can become confused thinking intellectual knowledge is real knowledge, and it's not. Number five is energy and enthusiasm for teaching. That's sort of straightforward, right? Number six is vast learning. Intellectual culture, in other words. There are instructors 
who only teach one or two aspects of the teaching. And this is unfortunate. An instructor should be teaching the entire doctrine. They may not understand everything, but should be seeking to understand and should be seeking to help the student to understand the whole doctrine, not just one or piece or a little piece here or there. And the reason is the entire doctrine is necessary for the growth of the soul, for the development of the consciousness, not just one or two points. And when the instructor is focusing solely on singular aspects of the teaching, they are degenerating that teaching. And this is what happened with Christianity. The, te- the instructors of Christianity in past times started cutting out things that they thought were too difficult to understand or too controversial. And what we're left with now is an empty shell because all the good bits were cut out. So a Gnostic instructor should not do that and commit that mistake. Therefore, a Gnostic instructor should have vast learning and should always be seeking to understand more. And this is particularly true nowadays. A Gnostic instructor should not simply understand a little bit about Christianity. Really, a Gnostic instructor should understand something about all religions. Uh, An example of this was actually told by the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama is a man of great learning who has an awesome understanding of so many things in life, not just religion, but also science. But he confessed at one point that he would like to understand more about Islam because it's something that he hasn't been exposed to very much. And he was expressing this to an Indian master. And the man from India said, oh, you know what? Just read a little bit of the Quran and memorize a few quotes, and that's all you need to know. This is wrong attitude. And the reason is it does disservice to that tradition of Islam. Really, every religion in its root is a gift from God and has beauties and subtleties and mysticism that are necessary for the development of a particular psychology. So as Gnostic instructors, we should all be seeking to understand each religion, not just superficially, not just to be able to say, well, the Buddha taught this and that. We should really study that. We should study the sutras. We should study the tantras. We should study all the great masters in order to add to our own understanding of Gnosis. Because really, gnosis is the doctrine of the synthesis. It's the glue that binds together the essential root of all religions. And an instructor who doesn't comprehend that can actually um, damage a student. Another example given is uh, there was an instructor giving a lecture, talking at length about Buddhism, but there was a student in the audience who had studied Buddhism and saw that much of what the teacher was saying contradicted the basic tenets of Buddhism. So after the lecture, this scholar in the audience came to the instructor and said, I don't understand. Some of the things you're saying contradict the Buddha. The instructor says, ah, it doesn't matter. It's not a big deal. This is a wrong attitude. This is a disservice, both to the students in the audience and to the teachings themselves. The doctrine is sacred. Before we teach something, we should have a good, thorough understanding of it and not presume to know something that we don't know, not act like something that we are not. The seventh quality is the realization of emptiness. In Gnosis, we call this the illuminating void. In in some traditions, it's called shunyata. This is the absolute. It's essential for a Gnostic instructor to have a strong understanding of the absolute. It is the very basis of the entire teaching. And an instructor who doesn't grasp that will be left without a foundation upon which they can teach. So as students, we have to look at that aspect, to study the doctrine of emptiness, to understand what that means. This includes the understanding of the nature of no self, the lack of a real I, but it goes beyond that. The eighth is to have some skill in presenting the teaching. 
In other words, to just have some basic teaching skill, to be able to present the teaching in a way that students can understand. And again, this is, this is a, a subtle thing because different people learn in different ways. When you approach a teacher, if they don't make any sense to you at all, then you've got your answer. You should find someone that can help you understand, that makes sense to you. The ninth is to have deep compassion. It may be said that this is the most important quality. When we as students are looking for a teacher, we have to be looking for someone who genuinely cares who's truly sacrificing their own time and energy to help others. How do we gauge that? There are many aspects to how compassion can reveal itself. Some teachers may appear severe and some may appear sweet. Some may appear indifferent. These are not reflections of compassion. They may be the personality of that person. You can instead... Look at the fruit they produce. What are their works? What do they actually accomplish? Compassion is, of course, love. Love does not always appear in a, in a sort of sanctimonious way or a sweet way. Love can appear to be very severe. So don't judge a teacher based on sweetness or severity. You have to judge a teacher on the result of their actions. For example, if we're a very undisciplined person, we may need a teacher to be very severe with us, to be very strong. But if, we're all, we, if we are very disciplined, maybe too disciplined, maybe too hard on ourselves, we may need a teacher who's very sweet. Some teachers can give both, but not all. Because we all have our skills, we all have our limitations. So be cautious when trying to analyze compassion. The result, the real measure of compassion is selflessness. The teacher who's giving of themselves without concern for their own welfare is showing true compassion. For example, the Master Samael and Vior wrote so many books and wrote so intensely that he was damaging his fingers. It was painful for him to write. But he also drew no income, no money. He did it because of love. That is a true sign of compassion. He didn't advertise that. He didn't go out to the students and say, see, my fingers, and I'm not making any money, and you guys should appreciate that. He didn't do that. He taught, he wrote. He didn't claim anything for himself, not even recognition or respect. That's a sign of compassion, because that compassion is selfless. There's nothing demanded. If an instructor is making demands for themselves, there's a problem. If they're demanding respect, if they're demanding fidelity, if they're demanding money or power, there is a problem. So be aware of it. The tenth quality is resilience. Did I spell that right? No. <laughs> resilience. And resilience in this case also has multiple aspects. But primarily we're looking for the resilience to teach the student no matter how many times the teaching has to be explained. A teacher who becomes impatient, who's demanding that a student move at a certain speed or advance to a certain level by a certain time is a teacher who has a problem. The teacher has to be patient and allow the student to grow at their own pace and have the patience and resilience to repeat the teachings to continue to assist the student for as long as it takes. 
Many uh, schools, unfortunately, set up rules or timelines. And they say, if you, don't, if you don't get to this point within six months or eight months or ten months, you're kicked out. This has nothing to do with gnosis. True comprehension of gnosis occurs over lifetimes. Lifetimes. This is not an easy science. This is not something you can accomplish like going to night school to get a degree. This is how we develop our own soul, our own consciousness. It is not easy. And it doesn't occur according to any notion of time. Time is irrelevant. Time does not exist. The great master of India, Padmasambhava, or Guru Rinpoche, made a very interesting statement, which the Tibetans will often repeat. And the statement is this. Time does not change. People change. Think about that. Time really does not change. Time is an illusion which exists only in a certain level of nature. So time does not change us, and time does not change. Time is just a mechanism of a certain level of nature. People change, either for the worse or for better. None of us are staying the same. We're in a constant process of change. But we have to change according to our own process, according to our own efforts. And the teacher should be there to guide us, to assist us, not to whip us, unless we need that for a moment, for a taste, for a touch, just to help us a little. But the constant whipping, the constant demands, the constant power plays, this is wrong. The instructor should have the resilience and patience to guide the student without expectations. Having said this and outlined these ten factors, take a look at your own mind and, and reflect upon your own intentions. And realize that you will accomplish according to your own effort. Gnosis is a form of self-development. No master, no teacher can save you. Even the Dalai Lama said, I cannot take anyone to nirvana. I cannot pull anyone out of the abyss. Each one has to do it for themselves. The Buddha said the same thing. The Buddha said, I cannot save you. Be your own master. In other words, the teacher should teach the student to be self-reliant. If a teacher is cultivating dependency to infect the student body with the notion that they are dependent upon the instructor, this is noxious. It is pride. If a teacher uses fear to infect the students with the belief that they need that student and that school, otherwise they'll go to hell, this is noxious and it is a lie. We acquire what we acquire spiritually because of our own internal development. This has nothing to do with schools at the end. I'm sorry, they need the teacher. I may have misstated that. Dependency can be a real problem in schools. The Dalai Lama also said a very nice thing about a real instructor. Obviously, we know that a real instructor should not be boasting about themselves should not be um, trying to acquire power, should not be trying to acquire money. This is a key thing. Let me stop there for a second. 
Gnosis is free. Gnosis is our birthright. Being in a physical body, you have the right to have Gnosis. No one has the right to be an obstacle to those teachings. Every human being has the right to enter into the full practical realization of Gnostic studies. Period. No one should ever be excluded from Gnosis because of money, because of status, because of their sex, because of their race, because of their culture. In fact, I would go as far as to say that an instructor or a school doesn't have the right to close their doors to anyone. And Samael and Vior stated as much time and again. Now, there are cases where certain students were asked to leave because it was clear that their intentions were bad. But this is a very subtle and very dangerous thing. There are, unfortunately, some schools that are always exiling people or setting up all kinds of rules and structures that students have to um, mold themselves to. And unfortunately, um, this has nothing to do with Gnosis. So it's sad. And there are, of course, those instructors who are putting putting themselves in the position of being absolute authorities over everyone's lives. This is also not Gnosis. I want to read you two little quotes that will help you understand what a true initiate should be like. The first one is from the Dalai Lama. He said, a true Mahayana teacher should be someone who enjoys simplicity, yearns to be anonymous, and as Tibetans would say, hides in solitude like a wounded animal. If you notice that an instructor is always seeking the limelight, always wanting to be the center of attention, is trying to become famous or respected, then you can see that that person has some problems. It doesn't mean that their teachings of Gnosis are wrong, but it means you should be cautious. The Dalai Lama continues, the Tibetan tradition states that Mahayana teachers should have at least two basic qualities. First, from the depth of their heart, they should regard the future life as more important than this. Without this, nothing one does becomes dharma. Second, teachers should regard the welfare of others as more important than their own. Without this, nothing one does becomes Mahayana. You might have the unfortunate experience of observing an instructor who is more concerned with his own welfare, his own situation, than that of his students. This is sad. So you can use this as a measure when you're looking to a teacher. What do they value? <clears throat> the Master Samael and Voyeur also stated some similar comments about what an instructor should be. So I'll read this one to you. He said, There are few who comprehend what the attributes of the great initiates are. This is why Gnostic apostles never lack a Judas who betrays them, a Peter who denies them, a Thomas who mortifies them with his doubts, and a Magdalene who cries for them. Great initiates are very simple, and this is why people underestimate and despise them. Everybody wants initiates to live according to people's routine life, according to people's established customs of erroneous criterion. When judgmental people try to evaluate the daily lives of the great initiates, They always judge mistakenly, since judgmental men do not comprehend the extreme simplicity of the great initiates. We need to be careful of those qualities in ourselves. When we're looking to our teacher, we have to be careful to not judge. We all have ego. We should always use the doctrine, the dharma, as the basis of our examination. Not our, not our morals, not our customs, not our own personal personality. We have to use the doctrine as the measure. And that's these ten steps outline aspects of the doctrine that we can use as a basis 
to understand an instructor. At the same time, we need to analyze ourselves. When we're looking at our teacher and trying to gauge whether or not somebody should be our teacher, we have to look at our own heart. Are we looking at this person because we resent authority? Because many of us have that. Many of us get involved with a school or a teacher and begin to contradict that instructor simply because we resent authority. Or perhaps we're always trying to gain their favor because we're afraid. So we have to be careful of this and watch our own intentions, watch our own motivations. But in synthesis, what we need to grasp is this. Whatever our instructor we study with, whatever type of person they are, they are just a person. And I'll read you another quote that the Buddha Shakyamuni said. which can be a very um, good indication of how to relate to a teacher. The first is, do not rely on a teacher's reputation, but on what he or she has to say. So we may hear a lot of things about a teacher, good and bad. But how do we know if it's gossip or envy or jealousy or anger? spreading lies. We don't necessarily know that. So we have to not listen to those rumors about someone's reputation, whether they're a good instructor or a bad instructor or an adulterer or a criminal. We have to listen to what they actually say. What are they actually teaching? Number two, don't rely on their, on their eloquence or their manner of speaking but on their actual words. We can easily become uh, hypnotized or fascinated with someone's personality or the way they present themselves. And we shouldn't allow that to filter our reception of the doctrine. We should listen instead to what they say. To not look at the face or the personality or the name or the culture or the background of the person but actually the meaning. What are they actually saying? What are those words? What is the meaning of their speech, their lecture? Number three, do not rely on words of interpretable meaning, which intend to lead deeper, but rely instead on the deeper meaning, the definitive meaning. So as an example, in the lecture today, I've interpreted some scripture. So you shouldn't rely on my interpretation. You should study that scripture and then measure, weigh the interpretation against it. And if it holds up, that's fine. And if it doesn't, you should reject what I've said. You should always test the words of your teacher. And all the great masters have said that. Don't believe me. Don't just take what I say at face value. Test it. You have to measure it. You have to beat it up. You have to be very firm and very strong in how you receive a teaching and make use of it. And the fourth, to understand the deeper meaning, do not rely on ordinary levels of mind, which make things appear different from the way they actually exist. Instead, rely on deep awareness. In other words, meditation. So to understand the deeper meaning of what's implied by today's lecture, you have to meditate. You can't rely just on the superficial level of mind that we're all accessing right now. And this is true of any part of Gnosis. When you receive a teaching, whether it's a lecture or studying a book, you should meditate. You should take that inside and analyze it in meditation. Because otherwise, the seeds that are present in that knowledge can easily be blown away and not take root in your mind stream, not take root in your heart. Meditation is how you digest that. You take from it the nutrients that your consciousness needs. Now you'll notice throughout this process of four steps that the fundamental uh, 
basis of it is you, not the teacher. The fundamental action, the fundamental energy is in you, not the instructor. The comprehension of gnosis is not something an instructor can give you. It's something you can only give yourself. So don't expect, don't go to an instructor and keep asking them lots and lots of questions all the time. It's good to ask questions and it's good to get answers. But you need to arrive at your own understanding. You need to arrive at your own conclusions. You need to test the teaching for yourself. It's your well-being that's at stake. It's the state of your own mind. It's the state of your own consciousness, which is in the balance. You can't trust that to any other person. You can't put your sanity into the hands of someone you don't know. You have to take responsibility for yourself. Now, to close this lecture, I want to address a question that often comes up. Who is, who is uh, qualified to teach? Who has the right to teach? And as I said in the beginning, in the Gnostic movement, we do not recognize any lineage. We recognize people by their fruits. In other words, if you want to know if someone is qualified to teach, then follow the advice of Jesus. You will know them by their fruit. You can't judge someone by a title or by what people say they are or what they say they are. You have to judge them by their fruit. And you can only know that with experience. So if you arrive at a school, be patient. Keep your eyes open. Remain aware and watch what happens. What kind of fruit is that school producing? What kind of students? What kind of activity? What are they doing for humanity? Is it an environment that is totally self-supported and, and enclosed and isolated from the world? Or is it an environment within which compassionate action is emphasized? Where selflessness is taught? You have to look at the fruits of the instructor to really know who that instructor is. As far as whether someone's qualified to teach, there are some who say that you have to be trained, that you have to go to a certain person and get permission. But the Master Samael M. Vior did not institute any such rule. Some of his students did. And that may be fine. But who gave Samael and Vior permission to teach? Who gave Jesus permission to teach? Who gave Moses for Krishna? We have to look into our own heart. I have a friend who, when he was 18 years old, got a copy of The Perfect Matrimony and read that book and studied that book and began to practice what was in that book and began to teach right away. Eighteen. And that was because he was driven to do so. Not out of a sense of glorifying himself, but because he recognized that the contents of that teaching were so important, so vital, so useful, that he wanted to share that with other people not for his benefit, for theirs. That compassion, that concern for others is the measure of someone who's prepared to teach. We're all at different levels of understanding. We're all at different levels of comprehension. But whatever level of, of understanding we have, there is someone who's got less understanding than us. There is someone who doesn't understand as much as we do. So we need to keep that in mind. We need an instructor, but there may be someone that we can teach at our own level. This doesn't mean that you should put yourself up on a pedestal. 
that you should go around calling yourself an instructor. No, we're all friends here. We're all equals. But each of us has something we can offer to humanity, even at our own level. There was a meeting in um, Latin America in 1976 of all the Gnostic instructors of that time. And there was a great debate, an argument actually, about how the Gnostic movement, this group of instructors, should be uh, getting teachers and working with instructors and sending those instructors out. You know, what are the qualifications? How do we know if someone's going to be a good instructor? How do we really, you know, what kind of structure do we need? How, how do we organize all this? There was a big argument. And, of course, Samael and Vior was quiet. But when the, it was clear that this group was not going to resolve it, he stood up and took the microphone. And I'm going to read you his statement. So I invite you to listen closely. Meditate and take these words into your heart because this is truly embodied in this little speech is the heart of this teaching. Here's what he said. We need missionaries who are properly prepared for America, Canada, and Europe. Patient men that will be able to support the most arduous disciplines. Friends of culture and true aspirants to pure science. We want our missionaries to have the feelings of an artist who loves science, philosophy, and mysticism. Missionaries who, as lovers of beauty, vibrate delectably before the Corinthian columns of Greece. Missionaries who feel in their hearts the mysticism of St. Francis of Assisi, missionaries who truly yearn for the wisdom of Egypt. We want missionaries within whom the beauty of the spirit and the force of love really shine. Missionaries who, while scientists, can also be poets, who can investigate the atom, yet stop and meditate in the singing rivulet that easily flows through a bed of rocks. Missionaries who meditate at the foot of the ruins of Athens or ancient Rome. Missionaries who know how to admire the chisel of Praxiteles. Missionaries who know how to really love all of humanity. Missionaries who vibrate with the lyre of Orpheus and who can sing with Homer in the delectable land of the Hellens. These are the missionaries we yearn for. Missionaries who admire the titillating light of the stars, who have an adorable fiancé whose name is Urania. These are the missionaries we yearn for. Missionaries who dress in the garment of sanctity, who love to put the carpet at the feet of their inner guru in order to receive his wise precepts. Missionaries who yearn for their in-depth Christification and can who can really feel the beauty of love as the brother Francis felt it within his heart. Missionaries like this are what we need. Far away from us be the thorn of slander that hurts the flesh of our neighbor. Far away from us be all wrath, greed, lust, envy, pride, laziness, and gluttony. Far away from us be the weeds of gossip and calumny. Far away from us be the filthy poison of envy. Far away from us be the monster of lust. We want missionaries who with the slow, rhythmic, and smooth steps of the great hermits go from door to door preaching the word. That is the class of missionaries we long for. In no way do we wish to make a business of gnosis. Covetousness be far away from us and from universal Gnosticism. We only want one solitary thing, to profoundly serve humanity. Look to your instructor for those qualities. Look to yourself. 
Are there any questions? If you have questions, feel free to post them in the forum. Oh, there's one. If the instructor says something in a lecture that you know contradicts your teachings in some way, which one is there? What would you do? If you find something in an instructor's teaching that contradicts the, the doctrine, you have to listen to your own sense of what's right and wrong. There's an example given of a lama who was with his instructor. And whenever the instructor would teach something very good and useful, this lama would say, yes, yes, that's very profound and excellent. Those are very good instructions. But when the teacher would say something wrong, that lama would say, no, 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 no one should say that. There was a dialogue. There was enough openness in their relationship that it could be discussed And this is an important quality. There are other examples of of teachers who, let's say, uh, teach about a certain aspect of the teaching, but the student is able to realize something that the teacher missed or was wrong about. That student should have the freedom to approach that instructor and point out the error. And the instructor should have the humility to be grateful and to correct their mistake. If you find that the environment is not conducive to that activity, for example, if the instructor doesn't want to hear it or refuses to recognize the mistake, or if the other students refuse to hear the contradiction, then there may be a problem. It may not be a good environment for you. It's said that uh, over... over, um, devoted, overprotective students can turn a real master into a false one. Students who overprotect their teacher, who refuse to allow their teacher to see their own contradictions, actually destroy that teacher. So all students should be willing to help an instructor see their own mistakes. This is why in Gnosis we emphasize that we're all friends, we're all equal. If any one of us had a perfect grasp of the teaching, we would be done. We would be awake. We wouldn't have any ego. But we all have ego. We all have misconceptions. We are all of us imperfect, and we need to help each other. Any other questions? Yes. That's absolutely true. When we find such a contradiction, we need to examine it carefully. A very good example of that is something that was discussed in recent lectures. Uh, We may see activities in an instructor's life that seem to contradict the teaching. So we need to really examine the doctrine. We need to really meditate and understand the activities of that person or the teaching of that person. And the reason is because each initiate, each aspirant, is dealing with their own individual karma. For someone to deal with their own individual karma, it may require action or activity that could appear to contradict the teaching. So, for example, what's good for me to do today could be really bad for you. And that's partly why we reject the notion of morals. It's not because we feel that you should be able to do whatever you want. Quite the opposite. You should do what's right. But what's right is not encased in morality. It's encased in the instructions of the I am, of our own inner being, or that primordial nature of mind. 
So if we see a contradiction, whether it's in a teaching or in an action, first we should compare it with the doctrine itself. We should study. We should really try to comprehend that, not in a judgmental way, but in order for our own well-being. And if we find that there is indeed a contradiction, we should probably first approach the source of it, that instructor. Not go around telling everyone, not go around gossiping or putting it on the Internet or raising a lot of doubts. Let me tell you something. It is a very severe karma to create a schism in a group. It's a very severe karma to damage the faith of the student body by creating doubt and gossip. The reason is because the well-being of all of those souls depends upon the strength of the doctrine as taught in that place. And if you come in with your doubts and with your gossip and with your criticisms and damage that, it's a very severe karma for you because it affects the whole group and could affect people you don't even see. Because gossip like that spreads like wildfire. You know what they say. I'm thinking it was Mark Twain. I think Mark Twain said something like, a lie is halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. <laughs> and this is, a, this is a fact. Be very careful. It's not just your own will be, well-being that's at stake. It's the well-being of all the students and the instructor. When you're in a group you have a responsibility as a member of that group to facilitate the well-being of that group. And I will promise you this, you will see contradictions because we all have ego. But we also have to see that there are different levels of comprehension. Yes, that's true. The point being made is that there are levels of comprehension. And this is why the Master Samael stated that people don't understand the initiates and criticize them and spread gossip about them because people at a certain level don't comprehend the nature of the level above them or even beyond that. So be prudent. Look to the fruits of action. Don't judge. Wait. There have been many, many cases in many groups, even especially in the Gnostic movement, of cases where a big rumor goes around, a big gossip, very damaging. And everybody believes it and everybody listens to it. A lot of people get hurt. And then in the end, it's realized it's not true. This is really inexcusable. It should not be allowed. But the ones who allow it are the students. Because the students are the ones who spread it. And I'm including instructors. Instructors are students of somebody else too. Gossip spreads because we allow it. Criticism spreads because we ourselves propagate it. So when we observe a contradiction, be patient, study, and give people the benefit of the doubt. Show everyone else the compassion that you yourself would like to receive. And know this, you yourself, if you persist in these studies, will be in the middle of contradictions. It's inevitable. You yourself will appear to be doing things that you should not. And people will criticize you. How would you want to be treated at that time? Prepare yourself for that by treating others with the respect and prudence and patience that that you yourself would like to receive. Any other questions? Of course. Yeah, the statement read by the master stated that we need patient men, but really it's we need people. We need people. It's a, it's a general term, so that's true. Any other questions? Okay. So if you have more, I invite you to post them in the forum. Otherwise, uh, we will not have a lecture next week due to the holiday, and we will make an announcement whether there will be a lecture after that. Thank you. Gnostic Radio is made possible through the financial support of listeners like you. 
To make a tax-deductible donation, visit our website at GnosticTeachings.org. For questions about this or other lectures, we invite you to participate in the free discussion forum at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you for your support. May all beings be happy.